Alright guys, Dominic here for Kit Guru, and today we are checking out Gigabyte's RX 6900 XT Gaming OC. It's funny to think that the 6900 XT only launched towards the beginning of last month. It really does feel like it's been significantly longer than that. But this is actually the first custom card we've been able to get our hands on for review. So the Gigabyte Gaming OC is a large triple fan triple slot card. And it also has the option for both a OC BIOS and a silent BIOS. So on paper, we're definitely expecting it to be better than the reference card. As we know though, expectations don't always live up to reality. So let's find out just how good this card really is. Before we do get into that though guys, I just want to say if you haven't already, please do hit that subscribe button, ding that notification bell. It's just a quick and easy way to help us out. Thank you. Back to the card though, we will start off with a look at the overall design. Now we have already reviewed Gigabyte's RTX 3070 gaming OC and it's not really a surprise to see that the overall aesthetic is exactly the same. So the card uses a mostly black plastic shroud but there are also some grey and silver accents just to break it up a little bit. It is still a very stealthy approach though so if you want a more understated card this could appeal. There is just a hint of RGB lighting, but it's only a single zone and it's just the Gigabyte logo. So it's really not a very flashy design at all. But like I said, that could appeal depending on your preference. In terms of the fans as well, Gigabyte is using three 80 millimeter spinners. As with all of the graphics cards from Gigabyte over the last couple of years, the central fan does spin in reverse relative to the outer two. And this should reduce overall airflow turbulence thus increasing airflow pressure down onto the heatsink itself. It's also worth noting the dimensions of the card. The gaming OC measures 286 by 118 by 58 millimeters. So it's not particularly long by modern standards, although it's hardly short, but it is effectively a triple slot thickness. So you will need three free expansion slots. Moving on to the front side of the card now, here we can see the dual BIOS switch. By default, the gaming OC uses the OC BIOS, but you can also switch it over to the silent BIOS. We do test these in detail later on in the review, so stick around if you want to find out how they perform. As for the backplate, it's a full length metal design being a sort of grayish silverish color. Unlike the 3070 gaming OC though, there's no cutouts at the end of the card, so no way for airflow to pass directly through the heatsink. Instead, it's gonna come out the sides and the back of the card. We can also note three eight pin PCIe power connectors. So that's an extra eight pin compared to the reference card. And we can also see display outputs consist of two HDMI 2.1 and then two DisplayPort 1.4a. Next up, we come to the PCB. Here, Gigabyte is using a semi-custom design which bears a number of similarities to the reference PCB. There is, however, an extra phase in the VRM as Gigabyte is using a 14 phase solution for the GPU and that's controlled by the Infineon XDPE 132G5D. The memory VRM is three phase controlled by the International Rectifier IR35217. We can also see that Gigabyte is using International Rectifier TDA21472 MOSFETs here and these are rated at 70 amps. For the cooler as well, Gigabyte uses two fin stacks that are connected by a total of six 6mm copper heat pipes. The GPU die and memory contact directly with a copper base plate, while there's some additional plates for the VRM, which contact via thermal pads. Lastly, we can also see the back plate uses a single thermal pad to contact with the back of the PCB. So that will do it for our look at the card and its cooler and now we're going to move on to talk about performance. To do this we used our regular GPU test system provided to us by PC Specialist. This consists of an i9-10900K running at 5.1 GHz on all cores. This is paired with the Asus RG Maximus 12 Hero motherboard and we also have 32GB of Corsair Vengeance DDR4 memory clocked at 3600MHz. So the first chart I want to show is going to be graphics card only power draw. And this is simply because when we look at the numbers, we can clearly see both the OC BIOS and the silent BIOS 
have the exact same power target. They're both drawing the exact same amount of power. As it turns out, the only difference between these two BIOS modes is the default fan curve. And for me, that is a bit disappointing. I really was hoping that Gigabyte would significantly increase the power limit, at least for the OC BIOS, maybe up to 350 watts or even more, particularly because it has three 8-pin power connectors. As it is, power draw is only 15 watts above the reference card. In the end, with that 15 watt increase compared to the reference design, average clock speed for the gaming OC is only about 80 MHz higher than AMD's reference, hitting 2300 MHz for the gaming OC. This is still an improvement, but it's not a huge difference. Given both BIOS options have the same power target as we mentioned, they also perform pretty much identically. We can see that by charting the clock speed behavior of the two modes, and they overlap pretty much perfectly, so you're not getting a performance advantage from one BIOS or the other. Given the only difference between the two BIOS modes is the fan curve, we can see that when looking at thermals. As a result of its more relaxed fan curve, the silent BIOS runs hotter, hitting a peak of 76 Celsius. The OC BIOS with its more aggressive fan curve runs a few degrees cooler, peaking at 72 C. Both are improvements over the reference card by between 3 to 7 degrees, but noise levels do also play a part in this. That's because Gigabyte's gaming OC is actually a little louder than the reference card. Not by a whole lot, but the silent BIOS is 2 decibels louder, while the OC BIOS is 4 decibels louder. In our testing, the silent BIOS saw the fans run at 57% or 1790 RPM, while the OC BIOS ramped things up to 62% or 1950 RPM. Contrast that with the three fans on the reference card, which spin at 1450 RPM, and it's not hard to see why the gaming OC is the louder graphics card. Bringing together thermals and noise levels now, we test noise normalized thermals. Here the results pretty much converge with just a 1C difference in terms of junction temperature and a 3C difference when looking at edge temperature. This does mean that the reference card is actually a little more efficient, but we do also have to factor power into the equation. The gaming OC may not have increased its power target by much, but it is still a little higher than the reference design, so it's not a complete apples to apples comparison. Either way, the result for the Gigabyte card is fine, but it's not a clear improvement over the reference design. In terms of gaming performance then, as you might have guessed when looking at the clock speed differences between the gaming OC and the reference card, Gigabyte's card isn't a whole lot faster, and we can see that by going over a few games here. We're only going to be focusing on the 4K charts, but if you do want to see 1080p and 1440p data for all the games we tested, head over to kitguru.net. We'll start off with Control. And here the gaming OC averaged 49 FPS, so it's just a single frame faster than the reference card, and that's a difference of 2%. We can also see another 2% margin when looking at F1 2020, where the gaming OC hits 134 FPS compared to 131 FPS for AMD's reference card. We really are talking very fine margins. The same also goes for Red Dead Redemption 2, with the gaming OC hitting 63 FPS, and that's a single frame faster than the reference model. So again, we're looking at another 2% difference. Across all seven games we tested then, it will be no surprise to hear that the gaming OC is, on average, 2% faster than the AMD reference card at both 1440p and 4K. Again, I come back to the fact that Gigabyte didn't really increase the power limit for this GPU, preventing it from running any faster than shown here. We can try and improve things via manual overclocking though, and here we push the power limit up to its maximum value, which is an extra 15%. Our best overclock came with 2600 MHz dialed in, while we also set the memory to 2120 MHz, as unfortunately, any further resulted in application crashes. All in all, this overclock resulted in a 4% boost to frame rates in F1 2020, we saw a 6% boost in Gears 5, and then a 5% increase in Watch Dogs Legion. It's perfectly okay, 
but nothing too spectacular. Power draw, meanwhile, hit 364 watts on average, and that's a 16% increase compared to stock. So then, that is going to do it for this review. All told, Gigabyte's RX 6900 XT Gaming OC is a perfectly fine graphics card, but it's safe to say it's not really blown me away. For me, the two main sticking points are the fact that Gigabyte didn't push the power limit far enough, and also the simple fact that the cooler isn't really an improvement over the reference card. It's fine, sure, it doesn't perform badly, but when looking at noise normalized thermals, it is fractionally hotter than the reference design. In terms of pricing and availability as well, you obviously don't need me to tell you things are a complete mess right now. AMD 6900 XT should have an MSRP of £899, and Gigabyte tells us the MSRP for this gaming OC model is £1,079, so that's almost £180 more than the reference card. In a normal world, if you could actually buy 6900 XTs for £899, I couldn't recommend paying an extra 20% for the gaming OC, simply because I don't think it's good enough to command that high of a price premium. It's not that much faster than the reference card after all, and it's not any better when looking at noise normalized thermals. Of course, that line of thinking is pretty much moot, considering the fact that 6900 XTs are simply not available, and certainly not for £899. All we can really say then is that in a future where you can buy a 6900 XT at that 899 MSRP, I would say the gaming OC would be worth picking up, but only if it was priced reasonably. I definitely wouldn't recommend paying an extra 20% over the baseline MSRP, but it is still a decent card, it does perform well, and it does have dual BIOS. So with the right pricing, it could be worth considering, but if it does come in at £1,079, that is going to make life a little bit tricky. So then, that is going to do it for this review, guys. If you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up and leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you think of this card and how much would you be prepared to pay for one. You can also subscribe if you haven't already, and there's a link to our Discord server in the description. You can also consider backing us on Patreon, where you can see some of our content early and also get access to exclusive giveaways. Until the next time though guys, I'm Dominic for Kit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.